you got a note for me? No, no. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to worship for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost here at First Lutheran Church. I'm going to put my school on. Uh, it's, a, it's a little discombobulation day, I think. Maybe the recombobulation zone like you have at the airport. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're, as we gather for worship here uh, in, in the lounge again, we're adjusting the liturgy of this week towards kind of our normal summertime liturgy with the holly, 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 hallelujah, and you are holy instead of the, the, the normal soft juice and holy, holy, holy that we sing the rest of the year. Um, we're going to start with All Who Are Thirsty as our singing song, which I know we all know. Um, and then after confession and forgiveness, the Listen God is Calling is a call and response song, too. Um, so pay attention, because on the verses, I'll sing the, the first half of each line, and then everyone else joins in on the second half of the line. Um, and then, I think those are my worship notes for us today. Uh, more announcements later. So I invite us to prepare for worship as we sing All Who Are Thirsty. All who are thirsty, come to the water. All who are hungry, come here and be. All who are thirsty, come to the water. There's enough for all who are thirsty, come to the water. All who are hungry, come here and eat. All who are thirsty, come to the waters. There's enough for all who are thirsty, come to the waters. All who are hungry,
happens in the citadels of Jerusalem, revealed to be the surge refuge of the city. Behold, the kings assembled and marched forward together. As they looked, they were astounded. Dismayed, they fled in terror. Trembling seized them there. They arrived like a woman in childbirth. With an east wind, you shattered them like the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, may God establish it forever. In the midst of your temple, O God, we meditate on your steadfast love. Your praise, like your name, O God, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad and the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Make the servant of Zion walk round about it, count the number of the city's towers. Consider well its ramparts, examine its strongholds, that you may tell those who come after. Mark this, God is our God forever and ever. Guiding us even to the end. The second reading is a reading from St. <clears throat> Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Word of God. Lord of life. Thanks be to God. in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not these his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And Jesus could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. 
Then Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Jesus said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Bear with me for a moment. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O our rock and our redeemer. This summer, since June, beginning of June, we've been reading the books of Samuel, the first and second Samuel, as our first reading. And we're going to keep reading Samuel and into 1 Kings through the rest of the summer. And so we've so far heard the call of Samuel, we've learned about the anointing of Saul, and then the anointing of David to replace Saul. We've mourned the death of Saul and Jonathan with David, hearing the power of lament last Sunday. And finally, this morning, we heard about David becoming king and uniting the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, for Saul was the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. They weren't yet united as one. <coughs> and then David moved the capital to Jerusalem where still 3,000 years later it's referred to as the city of David. This whole time, as we've been hearing about the story of David, we've also been hearing St. Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth and the Gospel according to Mark. And so, while I've mostly been focusing on the Samuel readings, this morning I'm going to take a excursion or diversion from Samuel and the David story into Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. This is a weird, weird one today. <laughs> like that thorn in the side thing and visions and what do you do with all that, right? So the church in Corinth is in trouble. Early on in his ministry, Paul made a visit to Corinth and he founded a church there. Later, he sent several pastoral letters to the church, only two of which survive today and are in our, in our modern Bible as 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. These were pastoral letters that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. There were probably more of them. These two were the two they held on to. At some point after that first letter, sent to address issues in the church, because all of these letters address issues in that community, the community to which they're sent. Sometime after that first letter, trouble arises again. And Paul found it necessary to send another letter, setting them straight on a few things. Most of the letter is pastoral teaching and guidance, how to live together in community, to care for one another. And at the end of the letter, Paul turns his attention to some super apostles, as our translation calls them. We don't have any direct accounts of these super apostles, but we can infer from Paul's writings and from knowledge of the culture at the time from extra-biblical sources that they're likely people who came into the community between the first and second letter, putting down his abilities as a teacher and a prophet, and raising themselves up for their own glory in various ways, including boasting of wisdom and power and using visions as a source of authority. They're advancing a message of the gospel that is different from the message of God's love in Christ taught by Paul. They're using the name of Christ to pervert the gospel as Paul would see it. It might sound familiar to some of us today as the name of Christ is used for things that we might not like to have the name of Christ used for. And this just won't do for Paul. Paul 
Paul uses a large section of this letter to the church in Corinth to defend his authority to teach and to reiterate the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of God, as it was revealed to him through his Damascus Road vision, as it was revealed to him through his sitting with the early disciples and the apostles and the other founders of the church for a long time, and to reiterate the gospel of Christ as he teaches it. Now, one of the key aspects of the super apostles' preaching seems to have been appealing to visionary experiences as the sources of their authority and power. And in his letter to the church, Paul turns the power of visions against the super apostles. He tells the story of a person in Christ who was snatched up the third seven to the third heaven, who went to paradise and heard the angels, but couldn't tell of what he heard. Many have interpreted this story as Paul telling of his own vision, as an appeal to a vision as a source of his own authority. It's often inter interpreted as meeting the super apostles in their own tactic and trying to one up them, perhaps. I think that's possible, but I actually think he's doing something different. We're going to do a bit of a close reading, more than I normally do in sermons today, to get at that. Because I think that instead of appealing to the visions as sources of authority and power, Paul is using humor and sarcasm and mockery to make his point and undermine his opponents. Because humor, and mockery especially, have been common in rhetoric and debate forever. Going back the centuries before Christ. In the 4th century BC, um, Aristophanes was a huge proponent in Greek circles of using, used a lot of mockery to go against Socrates in their debates in Greek philosophy four centuries before Paul. And in Paul's own culture, in the 1st century after Christ, the Roman poet Catullus, who might have been known a little bit to Paul by his writings, was kind of one of the original slam poets, as it were, using mockery in his poetry to put down other poets. It was part of the way you debated in that society. And so I don't think it would be outside the realm of possibility for that to be what Paul's doing here, to take someone else's argument to an extreme, to undermine the argument. Because that's what mockery is. It's not a, we hear the term mockery, we think ad hominem attack against a person. But I don't think that's what he's doing. I think he's taking someone else's argument to the extreme to undermine the argument, which is the, which is what mockery really is in its truth. And so and I also think that he's not mocking visions altogether as a source of authority, because he himself uses his own visions, claiming them, not in this third person, I know a man in Christ kind of way, but claiming his Damascus Road encounter as a source of authority, that he himself was visited by Christ and has that first-hand visionary experience. He uses that. He claims that. So I don't think he's not mocked. He's trying to discount visions altogether. I think if he was going to claim visions, he would claim his own. If he was going to claim it in this argument. And so, I think here, he turns away the super apostles, appeals to power and strength, through mocking their appeals to power, their appeals to visions. And ultimately, in his argument, he tries to point us all, the church in Corinth and us today, back to God's true power as being revealed in meekness and humility, not in glory and domination. Now, how does he do this? Well, those first couple verses have a few things that really stick out. This statement, whether in the body or not in the body, I don't know, God knows. And repeating that a few times. As humor through the repetition of this, I don't know, thing, this vagary and humility of not knowing. He also talks about the third heaven, a man in Christ who went up to the third heaven. But the thing about that is that in the various cosmologies of this time period. 
there were many different ways of understanding layers of heaven. And if, if you're going to refer to a third heaven, you have to identify which cosmology you're using. Because some have seven, some have five, some have nine. And so saying, you went up to the third heaven, Paul would have known, I need to identify my cosmology for this to make sense. The third of seven, what layer is that third? So by making this vague claim, whether in the body or out body, I don't know, only God knows, and went up to the third heaven, but not identifying which, which set of heavens you're talking about, is taking that, I can tell this vision too, to an extreme. Emphasizing the vagueness of it and undermining that if they can make that claim, so can I. And then he dismisses boasting for the sake of power and instead flips it to boasting in weakness. So he cuts off their visions by taking the, the examples to the extreme and mocking. Say, you can claim that, so can I. And shifting that I'm not going to boast about all the great things that I could boast about, but I will boast about humility and compassion and God meeting me where I am. Because he ultimately tries to point us back to the gospel. Because the, the super apostles have been preaching a different gospel, the details of which we don't know. But we do know that they were emphasizing power and strength that is very different from the gospel that Paul preached. The core of Paul's preaching is right here in this passage in verse 9. God's grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. This is the core of all of Paul's letters. God's grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in all of his letters circle around that core key in his understanding of God's love. Over and over again, they emphasize the sufficiency of God's grace. They emphasize that God's way of exercising power is different from the way the world emphasizes exercises power. For the world sees power through influence, control, strength. The world's power is power of compulsion. That's the way empires dominate. That's the way we try to dominate others sometimes. <clears throat> the world's idea of a God is of a God whose doings are things we can fathom, of, whose actions achieve the goals that we want. And over and over again, Paul's teachings have given a completely different idea of God's actions. Paul's teachings pull us away from a God that we can control, who does what we want on our timelines, pulls us away from thinking we can do it ourselves, and pulls us into God revealed in humility, God revealed in weakness, God revealed on the cross. Paul teaches that what the world calls wise, God calls foolish. That what the world calls strength, God calls weakness. Paul teaches that what the world sees as weak, humility, patience, perseverance, kindness, compassion, God sees as strength. The super apostles are boasting of their visions and preaching and modeling a gospel of self-glory and individual power, not grace. This is not God's gospel. This is not the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God's grace is enough. God's love is enough. The good news of Jesus Christ is that God's grace is big enough for all to join in. The good news of Jesus Christ is that power is made perfect in weakness. And God joins us in humiliating death on the cross and resurrection to the life. We may not necessarily have the same issues with super apostles now, but we definitely have people, politicians, religious leaders, advertisers, who boast of power and strength and control, seeking self-glory and advancing their claims and their agendas, and who pull 
us into these spheres of boasting and influence. We're pulled in by our own selves and by the voices in our culture into belief that we have to earn satisfaction. We are good Lutherans and we try to resist that belief. But the world pulls at us and pulls at us and pulls at us. We're pulled by our own selves and by voices in our culture toward those that exercise compelling power and exclude people from the love. We are pulled by our own selves and by voices in our culture away from God's love and towards that which makes sense to us, towards that which we can comprehend, that we can control. But God's love doesn't make sense at all. That's wonderful. God's love does not operate according to the power structures of the world that exercise domination and exclude. God's love does not operate according to our will, and I thank God for that. Because sometimes my will wouldn't be very great if God's love operated by it. God's power is made perfect in weakness. It's showing love in the face of hate and welcoming the stranger that you would rather turn away and going out two by two to proclaim the good news in word and deed. Trusting in God as we go out two by two. In Mark's gospel, when they're sent out, when the apostles are sent out, Jesus sends them out without taking anything. Not that they need to be self-sufficient or be or rely on the kindness of strangers, but that they need to rely on God and not put their trust in their money or the other things they can carry with them, but trust in God. That doesn't mean we don't prepare when we go out, but that we trust in God. They got a power to be perfect in weakness in saying to all, you are my sibling, my brother, my sister. You are my neighbor. You are loved. God's power is made perfect in weakness in dying on the cross of Christ and rising again to new life. For power is made perfect in weakness. God's grace is sufficient and boundless. Now,
time of professing our faith to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to sit or stand as you're comfortable for the purpose. One, in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in Glorious God, we bend down to wash the feet of your disciples. Let the servant church arise in our teaching, our praying, our healing, and our doing. Make all your faithful people powerful in weakness and strong in grace. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Life-giving God, your fingers straight to the heavens and your hands hold the earth. Where there is drought, bring nourishing rain. Where there is devastation from fire or flood, bring relief. Sustain the well-being of every living thing. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, you speak in the nations listen. Open those who govern to the cries of all who journey with no food or shelter. Particularly people fleeing violence, those seeking freedom, and those in search of community. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, your embers bring wholeness to those who are troubled, anoint all who suffer in any way with the oil of healing and grant them renewal, especially. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Welcoming God. In your presence, strangers become companions and enemies become neighbors. Open our doors to those we have so easily shut out, particularly people who are different from us or who are marginalized by church or society. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, you gather us into your house of many dwellings. We give you thanks for our faithful departed. Inspire us by their lives of faith until with them we rush forever at our journey's end. In your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I you to greet one another with a sign of justice. Peace be with you at home. Our uh, worship continues. But a couple of brief announcements and the offerings as we pass the offering plates around um, before we sing. Um, some brief announcements for today. This afternoon at 7 p.m. we have our, or 5 p.m., 5 p.m. is our trip to the Valley Cats game with several other of the churches in the Albany area. Um, Albany is just together churches plus eight churches, Coast and Hill and Faith, they're all joining us. It's really a hot one, but a good one. If you don't have tickets yet, you can still get tickets. 
The summer newsletter is available outside um, on the table by the door, and there's information about that and a whole lot of other things in the summer newsletter. Um, today is the day to turn in the Congregation Vitality Survey results, so if you haven't done that already, please have it in the online system by 10 a.m. tomorrow, because I'll be meeting with Pastor O'Leary at 10.30, so it should be you know, filed in by 10 a.m. tomorrow. There are paper copies over here if you'd like to do one before you leave today, and we'll get them logged into the system before that time, too. So that's going to help us meet with Pastor O'Leary, who's the Director of Evangelical Mission for the Senate, on Tuesday night with our council to kind of help us get a sense of where we're going and help us kind of navigate next steps as a congregation. Um, church council meeting Tuesday at 6. There's a lot of announcements. I'm sorry, a lot of people briefer. We might just skip this off, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> um, so um, the uh, Saturday morning at 9 a.m. at Cape Bay, is breakfast, and if you want to go tell Kirsten so we get a big enough table for us, I'll be there. I don't think I told you yet. On um, Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m., Good Shepherd is having their annual berry festival, so I encourage you to go over to Good Shepherd for some blueberries and strawberries and blackberries and whipped cream and biscuits and all the fun things of berry season Saturday afternoon. Um, I think those are all the announcements I have. Book club. Yes, so the book club was supposed to be last week, but like 11 o'clock the night before, I said, hey, y'all, can we move it? Because I haven't finished the book yet. And so the last month's book is actually going to be the, Jan the July book, which is the, the third week of July. Um, which, and then the July book is going to be the August book. And then we're going to do a book and recommended on creation care uh, for September. So, uh, which reminds me, the last two announcements I have. Um, coffee fellowship during fellowship during the summer is the we've got it set up lighter with some cold drinks and some package snacks and there's a whole bunch of more stuff from BJ's to rebuild those containers with so some of if you wanted to sign up to like set out the cold stuff and the snacks and then put them away that would be great if you want to do more and like bake something and bring it in and that's great too but we think it's nice to have some cold beverages and a little snack when we get together before church through the summer and then. Um, July 21st, I'm going to be on vacation, and in our last council meeting, we decided instead of bringing in a supply preacher, we're going to do brunch church with kind of member-led discussion kind of brunch church without bringing in a supply preacher that day. So there's also a clipboard to sign up for brunch church, what you're going to bring if you're going to be here, so that that can get organized. And that's two Sundays from today. We'll be at brunch church. Whew! Lots of announcements. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and so what we're going to do now we're going to sing Come to the Table, which we all should pretty much know from memory, so it's not on your page. We're just going to shift to that instead of singing the one on the page um, while we set the table for communion. So if you will um, come to the table, come to the table, all is now ready. Let us 
us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels of the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymns. <laughs> Thank 
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.